Gather round, Kaijus, for some more Sigma, Soul, Sustenance. It's your boy, Kajkong. Yep, here we go again, another long ass video, but this was made specifically to commemorate this channel reaching 4k subscribers. Thanks you guys so much and I hope you enjoy the video. I'll be presenting a lot of nuggets of knowledge in this one, but you've probably clicked on this video seeking a specific answer. I respect your time, so this video has been divided into timestamp sections for your convenience. Having said that, let's begin. Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma, Omega, Sigma and Zeta, these are all archetypes of the socio-sexual hierarchy that have recently surfaced. However, back then, people didn't have time to segregate. It was either you won or you lost, lived or died, were rich or poor, were respected or shunned, lived gloriously or died without a legacy. Times were tough. But one particular century also provided one of the grandest opportunities for men who wanted to go their own way. Men who sought the thrill of living on the edge. Men who were tired of the societal injustice and tyranny of the hierarchy. Men who yearned to recreate themselves and truly determine their own destiny. Welcome, my friends, to the golden age of piracy. And although piracy has always existed, wherever there were sea traders, there were sea thieves taking advantage of the weak. This particular period between the 17th and 18th century was when maritime piracy was truly at its most noticeable peak throughout the seas. In summary, the European powers of the time, namely England, France, Spain, Portugal and the Netherlands, focused their efforts on developing their colonial empires. And since all goods traveled by sea, of course, this massive trade network presented an opportunity to capture and steal from ships belonging to a rival empire. After all, all is fair in love and war. Majority of these maritime raids were carried out by independent seafarers known as privateers who were commissioned much like mercenaries to target ships of a rival nation. In short, privateers were basically pirates with a license. Unfortunately, after several treaties lessened the tension between the rival empires, hiring these sea marauders was no longer necessary. So suddenly finding themselves without work, these privateers were reluctant to just part with their ships and possessions and settle for a restrictive, low-paying job, as you can imagine. Seafaring and the opportunity for high-stakes fortune were all they knew. So most decided to continue down this more lucrative, albeit dangerous, lifestyle. However, this time, without an allegiance to any specific nation, virtually all ships within sight were potential targets for plunder. These men decided to take matters into their own hands, to establish their own identities, to go rogue, and it is no surprise that they became the scourge of the seas, hated and feared by the nations. Where the term sea dog was slang for an average seaman, the pirates were called the sea wolves. Unknown to even themselves, these outlaws were in fact the sigma and zeta males of the seas. Playing on the fringes of society, the flags they flew were not the colors of a nation, but their own. One example is the skull and crossbones design, which was largely adopted among English, French and Spanish pirates in the 1730s. Being a pirate, refusing to take part in the matrix that did not care for them, was no longer a brand of shame, but something they embraced with pride. Aside from the privateers, pirates also consisted of former sailors from the royal navies or sea merchants who deserted their original hierarchies after getting sick and tired of the unfavorable conditions suffered while working there. And although hygiene, health, and living conditions on pirate ships were far from ideal, the reason why many were attracted to join was that, unlike what many people think, pirates had a strict code of conduct. For one, Pirate captains had to be voted in and could be removed at any time. He also did not have the power of dictatorship over the rest of the crew, nor was he entitled to be treated any better, offered more food, nor slept in better quarters. 
A captain only had full authority during battles, but outside of battle, all men on board were treated equally and with mutual respect, much like a democracy. The crew shared in the loot and enjoyed a great deal of freedom. This plays into what I discussed in a video done quite some time ago, the link is in the card above, about how Sigma males resemble a tiger group, also known as an ambush, when they band together for one common purpose. I mean, look at it this way, pirates really do hunt down and ambush their targets. During my research, I was so inspired by the pirate life that I crafted a new design for the Kaiju merch store, which you can see on the screen right now. Link is in the description below for those of you sea wolves out there. By owning any of the merch items, you are directly supporting this channel, so a big thanks in advance. Back to the topic. I believe, however, that not all pirates were Sigma or Zeta males. The first few pirates who had the balls to defy society and stand alone against massive odds, yes, were indeed the true Sigma or Zeta males. They abandoned the concept of a hierarchy altogether and saw themselves as freedom fighters. Having laid the foundations for an alternative way of life, this presented an attractive escape, so to speak, for many other men still stuck and disappointed in the way their society was run. Now what you must understand is that when even outliers or outcasts start gathering together to form a group, they actually start establishing their own hierarchy, so to speak. So men who became pirates once piracy had already become mainstream were most often not Sigma or Zeta males. They effectively just adopted a new status quo and not really established their own like the pirate forefathers did back in their day. Furthermore, despite the code of equality, it is still evident from a bigger picture who in a group is the clear alpha Beta, Gamma, Delta, Omega, Sigma, and even Zeta. So on the search for an example of a Sigma male pirate, I've looked through a number of historical pirates, but due to the lack of sufficient literature into their way of life, I turned my sights instead to fictional pirates, most notably the cast within the Pirates of the Caribbean film series. Upon close analysis and further background research, it all played out in front of my eyes. Lo and behold, subtle yet equally evident there exists one man who truly emanates the Sigma soul. This man, the living legend, probably inspired those of you more adventurous Sigmas. And after watching this video, you will know just exactly why you felt that way. The character I'm referring to is none other than the Captain Jack Sparrow. Now I've just seen a thread on Reddit that identifies old Jack as a Sigma male. But what good is pointing without an explanation? What argument is convincing without the evidence? So here I am, my friends, to lay down the evidence on the table for you. You can then decide for yourselves. As I have previously mentioned, many pirates were Sigma males or Zeta males who created or joined a new hierarchy playing on the fringes of society, taking advantage of the system, yet not depending on it. So, among a group of Sigma males, how does one stand out as a Sigma male among Sigma males? That is the conundrum we will be tackling today. Firstly, Jack's ultimate goal and desire is freedom. The freedom to explore the world as he sees fit. He marches to the beat of his own drum. In fact, his one biggest fear is being stuck or having restrictions placed upon him. He was a loner since birth. Born on a pirate ship in the middle of a typhoon, the identities of his parents were a mystery to him, only confirming who his father was during his later years. As a teenage stowaway with a thirst for adventure, Jack worked as a cabin boy on several pirate ships and had the opportunity to visit many countries and ports. However, he became fed up working for other pirates and after consulting the pirate code, in which he stumbled upon the section on freedom and the importance for pirates to make their own decisions in life, he saw that making an escape was rationalized. Without further hesitation, he stowed away aboard a merchant ship bound for Tortuga, and that was when his life as a true lone wolf began. He didn't submit wholly to the pirate code, 
much less the laws belonging to society. When you analyze his actions closely, it is evident that deep down Jack was neither pirate nor civilian. He had no true allegiance. The only thing he truly defended was his personal identity. He only associated with the other hierarchies as a means to exercise his freedom. When accused by civilians of crimes, he uses being a pirate as an excuse for his immorality. And when defending himself against the accusations of his pirate brethren, he says that the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. To Jack, the only rules that mattered were what a man can do and what a man can't do. Therefore, unlike the majority, civilian or pirate alike, he saw freedom as not limited by the terms and conditions made by any hierarchy, but limited by one's own vision, capabilities, courage, and will to act. Now, there are many things that I do not condone in several of Jack Sparrow's actions. He is far from the best Sigma male role model, but I do have to admire Jack's wisdom that a man is limited only by himself. Many people today live confined in the prisons of their own minds. Often, what people fear doing is not even illegal. It is not the law that stops them, it is their doubts and insecurities. Reason number two. Jack Sparrow seems to be detached from almost everything, and this makes him hard to predict and even more difficult to control. An attachment to desires or possessions is a weak spot that gives others leverage to use against you once they find out what it is. For example, the alpha male Davy Jones, a supernatural and almost immortal being, whimpers like a dog when the opposing alpha male Captain Beckett acquires his heart. In Jack Sparrow's case, even the Song of Mermaids which lure ordinary men into the water to then be dragged and devoured in the depths did not sway him. He was immune to their charms because he merely appreciated women, love and beauty. His highest pursuit above all is freedom, which in itself is basically detachment. However, I did mention almost everything, as he does have a fond attachment to two things above all, the sea and his ship, the Black Pearl. Though when you think about it, the sea represents infinite opportunities, while his ship represents a means with which to freely explore those infinite opportunities. In other words, they still align with freedom. He had a particular attachment to the Black Pearl because it was the first ship he officially commanded, which back in the day was named the Wicked Wench. Still in his mid-twenties, it was on this ship that he experienced his first true taste of independence. An interesting note I wish to make is that I believe that not even Jack Sparrow himself knew and acknowledged that he was a Sigma male, of course, for back in those days it was either you were an Alpha or Beta, and he knew that he was definitely not a Beta. Therefore, he did possess lofty ambitions and competed like an Alpha. He jumps in and out of social circles to take what he wants but then ultimately sticks to himself. He is a quintessential example of a man who despite all the societal pressures around him to conform, stayed true to himself. I mean, come on, was it just me who noticed that Jack Sparrow is the only captain in most of the movies who doesn't have a fixed crew of men always following him around? And even as a leader, he leads by example, gets into the fray together with his men, and often performs most of the dirty work himself, while the rest of his crew stay safely on board a distance away. Although he prefers to be recognized with the title Captain Jack Sparrow, we see him mostly captaining his own life independently, more so than captaining and depending on a crew to get things done. Reason number three, Jack Sparrow, despite all his vices, stands out as a man of purpose. For the ordinary pirate, aka the Delta male pirate, the usual routine was to follow the captain, raid ships, plunder loot, and then head back to land to squander their new wealth on prostitutes and rum. Eventually finding themselves without coin, they would repeat the routine, essentially continuing the cycle until they died. Only a few dreamed and actually grasped for a life beyond what majority were content with. One of these few 
was Jack Sparrow. Where most considered piracy and life on the sea as a means to survive, kind of like a job, Jack saw life on the sea as his purpose. He was in love with the process, so to speak. It is not the destination so much as the journey, they say. He was not driven by common gold or plunder like the others. He was driven only by high-tier treasure and mythical artifacts that would enable him to better navigate and understand the mysteries of the sea. In fact, compared to others, Jack is what we would call a minimalist. He only keeps what is truly necessary. Everything else is a burden, again reinforcing his ideal for freedom. Jack likes women, but he doesn't let his sexual escapades define his masculinity. He likes rum more, but he is solely focused on his love for adventure above all. And in finding and acting all in on his purpose, he is able to experience much more out of life than the Delta male pirate who lacks a compelling purpose to dream and grasp for more. This is why it is important to understand yourself and where you belong in the world. Where is your realm of power? Establish your presence where you are strong or where your interests lie and go all in. You may be miserable now because you are doing something that you are not designed or destined to do. That misery is your soul telling you that your external circumstance is misaligned with your internal purpose. If Jack were put in a 9 to 5 job, he'd be sent straight away to the psychiatric ward and never again seen. He'd just be restrained in a padded cell, dreaming but never acting on his aspiration singing Yo ho, yo ho, a pirate's life for me. Reason number four. Jack Sparrow defies. He does not overthrow. You'll never make it out of the bay. Sam, I'm Captain Jack Sparrow. This is the hallmark that determines whether one is a Sigma male or a Zeta male. A Zeta male is the anti-alpha. He exists within an existing hierarchy and if he can, will dethrone the current alpha through winning the support of the members of the group or bringing in outside supporters to establish control. The early pirates, as I mentioned, either were sigmas in that they defied authorities' demands to get a legal job or they were zetas in that they once worked for either the Royal Navy or a merchant vessel and then mutinied against a captain in order to take control of the ship for their own ends. A clear-cut example of a Zeta male pirate is Jack Sparrow's former first mate, Hector Barbosa, who led a mutiny against Jack to take control of the Black Pearl. This brings into question how good a leader Jack Sparrow actually was, as Sigma males are usually only good as leaders temporarily for a specific purpose, after which they normally return to keeping to themselves. A detached leader is socially disconnected from his men, which may encourage strong-willed and charismatic individuals within the group to attempt to gain favor and take control. You were a poor captain, but a captain nonetheless. However, what usually tends to happen with Zeta males is that if they do not think through their strategy properly, they do lead themselves and their group astray. For example, after plundering the Aztec gold of Cortez, Barbosa and his crew were cursed to suffer immortality as living dead without the senses of taste nor touch. On the flip side, as a Sigma male, Jack Sparrow never once overthrew the leader of any social circle he was a part of. He just seemed not to care about and doesn't feel threatened by the authorities. He doesn't give a damn what others think about him. When he gets involved in a new social circle, he adopts the status quo momentarily to then defy the rules when it suits him. He does what ordinary men would not consider doing or would be afraid to do. For example, he was able to outwit the pirate hunter Armando Salazar of the Spanish Royal Navy, which from that day on earned him the name Sparrow. Even Jack's distinct and iconic style was created from this victory over the pirate hunter. It was custom for pirates to pay tribute to a successful captain, so the surviving crew members each paid Jack with personal items they valued which he sentimentally wears at all times such as the hat, the red bandana and the various jewels and trinkets that are braided into his hair. On one occasion, acting on his own judgment, 
he broke the pirate code and helped a rogue pirate escape, which effectively made him an outlaw in the eyes of the other pirate lords. What many don't know is that Jack also worked five years for the East India Trading Company, and this was where he actually was given command of the Wicked Wench as a merchant to transport goods. But upon realizing that one such exchange required him to transport slaves, he decided instead to set them free. Following his disobedience, he was captured shortly thereafter and branded a pirate for treason, while being made to watch his ship the Wicked Wench set aflame and sink to the depths of the ocean. Therefore, we confirm that he was officially recognized as a pirate because of his defiance. It was only through a deal made with Davy Jones that the Wicked Wench was resurrected and then renamed the Black Pearl, referring to the Pearl of Great Price, spoken of in the Bible. The bargain struck was 13 years of captaining the Black Pearl for 100 years of servitude under Davy Jones aboard the Flying Dutchman. And for those of you who've watched Dead Man's Chest, you're very well aware that Jack tried to scheme a way even out of this pact. Reason number 5. Jack Sparrow is an example of how a mature Sigma male is more powerful than an Alpha male. As I like to say, a mature Sigma male eventually finds himself attached to nothing, surprised at nothing, afraid of nothing. Following his free spirit and lofty ambitions, Jack has experienced far more than his fair share of the world. He understands and can thrive in virtually any social hierarchy he finds himself in. His reputation and notoriety are merely byproducts of marching confidently to his own beat. It is evident on many occasions how many people think they are in control. But in fact, Jack is always one step ahead and is setting things up his way. I believe his idiotic and ever drunk first impression is a well constructed act on his part to let people's guards down by making them underestimate him. He must have gained the wisdom over years of pirate business that it is better to look like a fool so that people will dismiss your successes as sheer luck than to appear quiet and calculating and stir up suspicion as a potential threat to others. By looking like less of an interesting target, he has a higher chance of getting away with things without others interfering. Despite being one of the more in-your-face and outspoken characters, this flamboyant front actually hides more secrets than the quieter characters. The films have proven surprisingly time and again that Jack always has got an ace up his sleeve and is highly street smart in navigating in and out of situations. A wizard disguised as a joker, slies a fox, he uses his wits to triumph over those who threaten his independence. As he is famous for saying, you will always remember this day as the day you almost caught Jack Sparrow. Nearly all of the antagonists in the films are alpha males, and you can clearly see how a sigma male manages to win in the end. He is quite unpredictable and difficult to define, which is both a frustration to his enemies, but a delight to our entertainment. All we see him doing is briefly look down at his compass, which all we know points to what he desires most at any given moment though exactly what is not explicitly told. He seems to be in one place one day and then on the completely opposite corner of the world the next. As is evident, despite playing on the fringes of both the societal and piratical hierarchies, he still manages to be extraordinarily successful. This is why I keep stressing the importance for Sigma males in their younger years to likewise compete like an alpha. Competition is healthy, competition enables you to live life to your fullest potential. Come to think of it, competition is the reason why you were born. You were the sperm who literally won the race. Have big, lofty dreams and chase after them by any means necessary. Your youth is not the time to give up on your hidden potential. Your youth is not the time to chill. You may make mistakes. But mistakes are actually successes that let you know what does not work. Competition inspires one to take action. Taking action causes one to better identify and capitalize on one's strengths. Identifying one's strengths allows one to better create and benefit the world. And if you don't create and benefit the world in whatever way, then you're practically useless. 
Even the means through which you are watching this video right now, the internet, was conceived during the Cold War, which was basically a competition between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. That is how the world improves itself. Above all, compete with yourself. By being all around better as a man, you're able to live better and more independently, free from fear, free from disease, free from a lack of self-confidence, free from the opinions of others, free to share your abundance with those you care about, and free to spend your time doing what you love and are good at. The final reason that I wish to point out is that Jack Sparrow clearly stands out from the already unique cast of characters. Jack's distinct charisma sets him apart from the rest and keeps us wondering what he'll do next. He is a stark contrast to the typical masculine heroes featured in most films and in doing so gave viewers an alternative male role model. He exudes self-confidence and in that many can't help but silently admire him. The key factors being unapologetically himself and his competence. Interestingly, Jack Sparrow was originally intended to be a supporting character and the filmmakers actually meant for the audience's focus to be on the protagonists Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan in the first movie. Even the higher ups in Disney did not initially approve of the way Johnny Depp was portraying the character. Therefore, the mere portrayal of Jack Sparrow as a character was actually a defiance in the face of authority to what was originally designed by the filmmakers and a silent struggle to be oneself in the face of opposition. Despite this, the audience loved him and it is safe to say that it was Jack Sparrow who was largely to thank for the film's overwhelming success and even the pirate costume merchandise that Disney was able to sell in the subsequent years. I mean, come to think of it, when have you ever seen a kid tugging at his mom's sleeve saying, Mom, I want to dress up for Halloween like Will Turner. Another interesting fact was that the role of Jack Sparrow was formally designed for the actor Hugh Jackman, which explains the name Jack, taken from Jackman. Now this is a long stretch but still deserves mentioning. Hugh Jackman is famous for his role as Wolverine in the X-Men series. And isn't Wolverine too a Sigma male? The points just keep adding up, my friends. Jack Sparrow was designed already as a Sigma male character, probably not as flamboyant as Johnny Depp's portrayal, but a Sigma male character nevertheless. Let me end with this, brothers. There are many things we can learn from Captain Jack Sparrow, but I believe the key takeaway is to follow your own compass. This will lead you to freedom, mate. And not be afraid of exerting your own uniqueness, or rather, be confident to show up in the world and grasp for that which you believe is destined to you. Despite what others say or how they try to hold you down, you will stray strong. So that's it my friends, I hope you enjoyed and thanks for listening all the way. If this video helped you in any way, if you learned something new or gained a new perspective even if it made you feel better, all I ask is that you leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Feel free to share this video with friends or family who you might think benefit from this message. So this is Kaiju Kong signing off, stray strong and take care.